This is The Secret Life of Canada, a podcast that looks at the undertold and untold stories of Canadian history. Hey, Leah. Hey, Phelan. So today's episode is a little different than what we normally do. And how so? Okay. Leah, tell me what these things have in common. Nanaimo bars, butter tarts, beaver tails. They induce diabetes. That's probably very true, but no, that's not what I'm after here. They are all Canadian. Ketchup chips are Canadian, right? If they are, you can call me a proud Canadian. Canada's on point when it comes to chips. We have ketchup chips. We have all dressed, maple bacon, scallop potato, Canadian burger, whatever that is, smoking stampede. Oh my God. Sorry, I just had to start having some chips. I like all of those. <laughs> Fries and gravy, uh-huh. Swiss chalet sauce, poutine chips, sour cream and bacon, dill pickle, roast chicken, hickory sticks. Wait. Are those technically a chip, though? I'm going to say they are. Storm chips. What the hell are storm chips? Okay, so basically on the East Coast, when a storm is coming in, people will buy a bunch of chips so they can snack while they ride out a storm. The term started a few years back in 2014 when Stephanie Dome, a CBC radio anchor, snapped a pic of chips and tweeted, success, hashtag storm chips. The hashtag went viral and now there's even a brand that makes a storm chip. So what do storm chips taste like? Like road salt and emergency candles? (laughs) No, it's actually just like barbecue, salt and vinegar, dill pickle and ketchup. So like a deconstructed all dress. I guess that would be a fancy way of saying it, yes. Okay, so aside from the myriad of chip flavors, there are a number of other famous Canadian snacks. And today, Leah, we're gonna look at some of Canada's favorite snacks and learn where they come from. I'm going to feel gross after this, aren't I? Oh, you will, but it'll be fun. (laughs) All right, if you say so. Okay, first up, the cocktail course. I I don't think that's an actual course. It is today. Okay. Well, um, what do you have? Ontario ice wine, a high alcohol percentage Canadian beer, maybe some Newfoundland screech? Leah, it's it's four in the afternoon. We can't be drinking screech. (laughs) Oh, is that not a thing? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, that w- that's ridiculous to do that at four in the afternoon. I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and while those those boozes are all really good examples of Canadian drinks, I thought today we would go with the quintessentially Canadian cocktail, the Caesar. Okay, that I can do. Okay, just wait right here. I'm going to go make you one. Okay. Okay. Cheers! Okay. Oh, don't drop uh, it on that. This is dangerous to do in a blanket form. Cheers for everyone. It's hard to clink these glasses, actually. There we go. Okay. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Ooh, that's... Oh, that's a spicy season, Is that spicy? Did I make it too spicy? (laughs) That's... It feels like I'm only drinking hot sauce right now. (laughs) I'm going to have some celery to just wash it down. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's why it's so good, because it's like a meal. This is going to be an inappropriate end to an episode, because there's a lot of alcohol in this. I can already feel it. Not a lot. (laughs) Okay, so tell me about the Caesar. All right. Um, So the classic Caesar, which is what we are having here today, Mm -hmm. is made by using lemon or lime and rimming the glass with celery salt. You then put in some ice, pour in the vodka, clam juice, a.k.a. Clamato, and uh, throw in a celery stick and a wedge of citrus. And while clam juice can sound kind of gross, it's pretty good. So who was it who had the idea to put vodka and clams together? Well, this national treasure has somewhat murky origins. What I found is that in 1969, Calgary restaurant manager Walter Schell was tasked with creating a new cocktail to celebrate the opening of a restaurant in Calgary at the Calgary Inn. Walter drew inspiration from a popular Italian dish, a dish with a tomato clam sauce. But pre-made Clamato juice was sold in the U.S. as early as 1961. And so there are other reports that another Clamato-based vodka drink uh, predates Shell's creation. So wait, it's not Canadian? Again, it's a bit murky. But what I think makes this drink Canadian is the distinct popularity it has in Canada. The country has really embraced the drink. It's been called the National Cocktail and even has its own day. May 18th is National Caesar Day in Canada. Finally, a celebration I can get behind. But the Caesar has become really intense in some bars. It can in some, some bars? It's intense right here. It's like burning <laughs> a hole down my... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my God, it's so 
Do you want more Clamato? <laughs> no, no, let's just keep going. This we, doesn't bode well for the, the rest of the courses. Once we're in the fort, we can't leave the fort. Okay. But the Caesar has become really intense in some bars. It can become like a full meal. There's even one restaurant in Vancouver that serves a Caesar with the following garnishes. Roasted chicken, a burger, onion rings, chicken wings, a pulled pork, mac and cheese hot dog, and a brownie oh, for dessert. And that, it all comes stacked no, on the cup. that sounds disgusting. I mean, it definitely should come with a Tums chaser, I'm hoping. Or Okay, well, now that you have your very spicy drink, mm-hmm. I can offer you our second course, the appetizer course. Ooh, I know what that is. Coming into the fort. Really all right, all right. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Lamming into the uh, fort. All right, here you. you go. Okay. Oh, yeah. Love it. It's not bad. It's so good. So it's Bannock. <laughs> it's like, you need I'm to kind of... <laughs> It's Bannock. Okay, so Bannock is a traditional style bread that many indigenous people have variations of, both in the U.S. and in Canada. It's called Bannock, scone, or fry bread. So how are they different? And by the way, it's scone. It's not scone. It, it's not scone. Do not even. Scone? You go You go to a reserve and you say scone. You watch what happens. <laughs> what? They just go, actually, it's scone. No, no. Are you kidding They're me? They're going to physically hurt me? No, they'll just laugh at okay, you a well, lot. Okay, well, that's and fine. trust me. You sounded way more ominous. It was like, if it, you come it, onto a reserve and you say scone. You mean scone? Right, and now I'm confused. Well, anyway, good. it doesn't matter. You, you're not pronouncing it correctly. Continue. No, I'm... Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> drink your drink. <laughs> okay, so mainly the difference between bannock, scone, or fry bread is the preparation. Bannock is sometimes called scone when it's made on top of the stove or in the oven, and fry bread is fried in oil on top of the stove. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So, but the bannock ingredients are basically the same. It's usually some combination of flour, water, milk, lard, or butter, baking powder, and salt. Sometimes there are variations on this, and you can add raisins or berries or whatever you want. It can be savory or sweet. It's incredibly versatile. So where does it come from? Where, where are the origins of this food? Well, there are some reports of indigenous people on the West Coast making something similar with a casma bulb, which is kind of like a sweet potato. The casma bulb would be earth roasted for a long period of time and then dried and formed into cakes. Some people think that this is where the origins for Bannock may come from. When the country was being formed, the government really wanted indigenous people to move and stay on reserves. And so this was a way to make way for settlers and the development of the railroad as it moved from east to west. Food rations were used as a kind of incentive by the government to move people onto reserves and sort of get out of Canada's way. And this is when the buffalo on the prairies were being massacred at an exorbitant rate. Exactly. Traditional ways of eating were being compromised more and more, and so Indigenous people needed those government rations. People were literally starving. So the government said, come to the res, get your flour, and make your cheap food with it. Make bannock. And the word bannock, it's, it actually comes from the Scottish word bannock, um, and that's why we say scone. So it's it's a really actually kind of astonishing and depressing origin for such a great tasty food. This is true. All right, up next, the main course. Wait, wait, wait. I have a contribution to this if wait. we're going to do Canadian food. You, okay. And I know I said we can't leave the blanket yeah, for once we're in, but I, I got to go to the kitchen for this one. What is that? A uh, pizza pop. <laughs> when I was in high school, I lived on these. Okay. Okay. Here's one. Oh my god. I'll hold it over the plate there. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> Ow. Oh my a, god. What is that? <laughs> I can't believe I ate those like consistently. Uh. As Why a, did I take such a big bite? <laughs> I took way too big of a bite. And I got like a meat thing in there. I got a pepper, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they technically are a Canadian invention. That's so right. In 1964, a Winnipeg resident, Paul Faraci, invented the pizza pop, a miniature calzone. 
Farachi made the pops in a restaurant in Winnipeg, sold them there, and then took them to local fairs and festivals to sell. I can only think that they were way better than what we're eating here, the originals. But <laughs> It's weird. You know what? When they say, like, you can never go back, they ain't joking. Because that stuff used to be so good growing can... up, and now it tastes like... It's like if they made baby food, like pizza baby food. So they became pretty popular. And in 1987, Farachi sold the pizza pop business to Pillsbury. Pizza pops are still being made in Winnipeg and are only available in Canada. You know a lot about these pizza I mean, pops. I used to buy these at the corner store where they would microwave them in their plastic wrapping. And fun fact, I grew an extra toe. <laughs> We've now had our cocktail mm-hmm. course, our appetizer course, mm-hmm. a surprise course. Yeah. Shall we move on to the main that I have selected for us to try? <laughs> oh, I'm going to get diarrhea, aren't I? <laughs> oh, God. Hey, you're the one who brought the surprise course. <laughs> Okay, me too. But damn it, Leah, this is for education. (laughs) And you're going to like this one. Okay. Are you ready for poutine? Oh, yes. Okay, yes, that is a good food. (laughs) I actually ate a lot of this when I was in high school, but like a crappy home version. Oh, man, pizza pockets and poutine. How are we still alive? I have no idea. Okay, but back to poutine. So in its simplest form, poutine consists of fries, gravy, and cheese curds. But just like any other great food, it has some serious rules around proper ingredients. Some say the fries need to be double fried. Others say a lighter type of gravy is necessary. Chicken, veal, or turkey gravy, for instance. What we all can agree upon is that curds is a must. If you don't have curds, you aren't having poutine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I love it. It's pretty good. I mean, fries and gravy with a little bit of cheese. Who can argue with that? I know. I can't argue with fries. I can't argue with gravy. No. And I'm definitely not going to argue if you put cheese on top. No. It's right. amazing. Okay. So in the U.S., there are some places that have uh, something called disco fries, which are similar to poutine, but not poutine. The difference being uh, that the curds are replaced with mozzarella cheese. They're called disco fries because in the 70s and 80s, people in New Jersey and New York who were on their way home from the disco would order them, hence disco fries. So disco fries are... Like the tacky Jersey cousin of poutine. Well, the roots of poutine here in Canada aren't super glamorous, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. And there are a few different origin stories for the food. One story has the greasy snack being invented in 1957 in Warwick, Quebec, by Fernand Lachance of Café Ideal. Fernand says that at the request of a patron, he added curds to an order of fries. It is said that when the order was placed, Lachance exclaimed, Ça va faire un monde poutine. Which translates to, That will make a damn mess. Gravy was a later addition, I guess to make more of a mess, but also to keep the fries warm. Another story puts the origin of poutine occurring in Drummondville, Quebec, where in 1958, uh, the restaurant Le Roy Giuseppe was serving something called patate sauce, which I think is just fries and gravy. And by 1964, the owner of the restaurant noticed customers were adding cheese curds to the patate sauce, and so he added fromage patate sauce to his menu. So fries, gravy, and cheese. That's my understanding, but my French is pretty bad. I did read that the word for the food poutine could have originated from the English word for pudding or poudin as it would be in French, uh, which would mean messy food. And in Quebec, poutine can be slang for a mess. Well, looking at what we have left on this plate and in the blanket for it, I would say that's pretty apt. Some also say that the word may come from patate or Poutit, uh, which is a potato ragu. So even if we don't know the specifics, what we do know is that poutine was a Quebec invention. Yeah, and more than that, we know that it was a rural Quebec invention. One thing I did read about was that although the specific place where poutine was invented is a bit difficult to pin down, what we do know is that poutine was being eaten and made in rural Quebec near fromageries where people were making cheese curds. There's so much history for a food that is commonly referred to as drunk food. I know. Well, Leah, that wraps up our main course. Shall we move on to our (laughs) final course, dessert? (laughs) Okay, before I have a heart attack or soil myself? Exactly. (laughs) Wonderful. Let's do this. So, dessert, Leah. Mm -hmm. Canada has a lot of desserts, like way too many, like seriously, Canada. Well, I consider that a national strength. (laughs) I do have to say, like there were a million to choose from, from the Canadian canon, from the beaver tail to tiger tail ice cream. There were two desserts that came up over and over when I was researching, the Nanaimo bar and the butter tart. And so today, for our fifth and final course, we will have butter tarts. 
And let me tell you, there is some serious Canadian passion around the butter tart. Okay, well, I feel like that is really clear in this episode. People have some serious feelings about their food in Canada. All right. Are you ready? Yes. Mm-hmm. And ta-da! Here is your fifth and final course dessert, Leah. Okay. I just have to t- confess something. I was really excited when you said Nanaimo bar, and then my heart sank when you said butter tart, because I love Nanaimo bars, and I really don't really like butter tarts. And this one, I can tell that you bought at the corner store for like 50 cents. You did, didn't you? Well, this isn't I'm, real. Okay, I'm not okay. I'm not much of a baker. I'm still going to um, try it. But I mean, you know, that's how like, you can tell it's like a, a, a okay, quintessential. Okay, <laughs> I I think it pairs very well with the Caesar. (laughs) It's like making my heart race. There's so much sugar in there. Okay, hold on. I'm going to try it. I have had people's homemade butter tarts, and they are really beautiful. But I find most are, you know, store-bought. They're they're not good. When I was doing the research, like, it was Nanaimo bar, butter tart. Mm -hmm. And butter tart is the thing that I could get my hands Mm -hmm. on today. I asked some Canadians what they thought about the butter tart. I don't like them. I know they're Canadian, but they're very sugary. They often have raisins, and I don't like raisins. But even without the raisins, they're just a gooey texture without a lot of taste and just very sugary. Butter tarts are delicious. I have not had one in a very, very long time, but I grew up on store-bought grocery store A&P butter tarts. Because my dad loved them. Um, the first half of the butter tart that I eat, like I really enjoy that first half, but then I can't. It's just too much sugar for the second half. So it's good to have a butter tart friend. I love them. My mom has always made them. Like they're like a holiday tradition. So I've always, I've always had them in, I guess I've always had them in my life. And now that I'm older, my mom does all her Christmas like holiday baking prior to me getting there. And so when I arrive, my mom takes them out of the freezer, she takes a butter tart out of the freezer, has them all, and once they thaw, we have them. They're like, super treat. When I was researching about butter tarts, what a fun month for me. <clears throat> so many people are adamant about about butter tarts and what goes in the filling, raisins or no raisins, nuts or no nuts, even the firmness of the filling being a point of contention. Some people even put bacon in them. Ugh. But I'm not surprised. Yeah, we are basically living in the age of bacon. So the classic butter tart, according to Chatelaine magazine, consists of a mini pie crust, like a tart, filled with brown sugar, corn syrup, maple syrup, eggs, butter, vanilla, vinegar, and salt. And when I looked into the history of the butter tart, I saw just how far back its story stretches. Although the first published recipe has been traced to 1900 in the Royal Victoria Cookbook, there is evidence that the origins may go back as far as 1663. This was when France sent women over to Quebec to help colonize the quote-unquote New World. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Approximately 800 French women, who were called the Filles de Roi, were or the King's Daughters, they were sent over to help with the gender imbalance in the colonies. So there were no women, so that means all the men were just kind of... Maybe eating a different kind of butter tart. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, but what these women brought with them was probably the basis of what we now know as butter tarts. Well, that's quite a history lesson. It really is. Um, With the conclusion of dessert, that brings us to the end of our five-course culinary tour. Thank you. (laughs) Oh, you're welcome. And those are just some of the Canadian grades. There are so many more snacks we didn't get to, and I just want to say, craft dinner, thank you. You've saved me when I've been yes. really broke. Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry, Tortier, I do love you. Sorry, lobster rolls, I think I love you yep. the most. Yep. I'm sorry, Halifax Donaires with I'm your not. sweet, sweet no. sauce. I love you. It's not good. I'm it's sorry. It's so good. I just want to take a, a moment here and say to all the maple syrup I've eaten in my life, I love you and cup less. That Caesar was strong. <laughs> <laughs> I think the biggest takeaway I found from this episode was that, you know, Canada really struggles with its identity, who it is. And I think when we get known for something Canadian, we want it to be super Canadian. We hold on to it really tight. We can become a bit obsessive about the way 
that it should be in, consumed or enjoyed. It's like when something gets called Canadian, people can't help but put another Canadian food on top of it. Caesar, put a lobster roll in it. Poutine, put some lobster on that. Alphagetti, put some lobster in that alphagetti. I mean, alphagetti. actually, that would really ruin the lobster, so don't do that. Thank you for coming on this culinary tour, Leah. And, uh, Thank you I for hope, having me. Yeah, no problem. I hope I didn't make you feel... Disgusting. Yeah, I totally feel disgusting. <laughs> and I'm going to spend the night just maybe with a glass of Alka Seltzer and some. <laughs> you can cook next time. Dr- drawstring pants <laughs> that I can just keep open for the rest of the night. <laughs> Thanks, Felon. I'm getting out of the blanket for now. <laughs> The Secret Life of Canada is recorded in Toronto on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. It's hosted by me, Leah Simone Bowen. And me, Phelan Johnson. And produced by Katie Jensen. Nathan Burley wrote and performed our theme song. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Secret Life CAD. If there's a story you would like to see in an episode or a piece of history you would like to tell us about, please email us at secretlifeofcanada at gmail.com. Thanks for exploring Canada's hidden history with us. And remember, pass it on. <laughs>